My number eight game of the 2010s is Ding Liren's Immortal Game against Bai Jin Shi. This spectacular game features an attack and king hunt that works just like clockwork to bring down the wandering white king. Bai selects pawn to d4 and Ding Liren's going to choose a Nimzo Indian defense to respond with in this position. Now, after the trade on d4 here with queen takes d4, knight c6, the novelty here is queen to d3, but this is a pretty normal position and it seems likely that both players might have this position on their computers. They might have quite a lot of analysis of this line here. Now, after queen d3, we get h6 pushing the bishop back. It falls back. We get d5 here expanding in the middle. I have to be honest, I don't really love playing the white side of this sort of Nimzo Indian defense. Now, there's nothing wrong with white's position. In fact, maybe a3 is pretty good here trying to gain the bishop pair. But black is the one castled. Black is the one better developed. Black has more pawns in the middle of the board. I always feel like as white, I'm the one struggling to make sense of my position here. And it certainly seems like in this game, Bai Jin Shi is in the same spot I've often found myself in. Now rook d1 is played, trying to create pressure on the d-file, and great move from Ding Liren here, pawn to g5, breaking the pin. Now many beginning and intermediate players, including this guy right here, might struggle to play a move like g5 because you're opening up your castled position. However, you get a lot of activity here. You're freeing your knight on f6 by breaking this pin, and that's going to allow you to hop into e4 with real and important pressure as we're going to see in the game. In this kind of case, you should value the activity you're able to generate over a theoretical weakness to your king down the road when white is just in no position to actually checkmate your king anytime soon. So g5, bishop to g3, knight to e4. Now knight d2 is a really important move here. This is a very common way to break the pressure here from a knight on e4 and a bishop on b4. See the Cambridge Springs variation and other important opening lines. So, knight d2 does happen. The knight falls back from e4 to c5, kicking the queen back. d4 happens. Very nice move, expanding in the middle of the board, gaining more tempo. Now, the knight moves to f3. There is now a pin on the d file, so white or black is not in a position to capture on c3 here. And instead, Ding plays pawn to e5, a move that to me feels like preparation and creates a really difficult problem for Bai Jin Shi. Now, practically, I feel like Bai Jin Shi makes the wrong decision here, even though objectively he may still be okay. I think that the right decision is bishop takes e5 when after knight takes, knight takes. Here you've captured a pawn. Queen to f6 is the strongest move. It attacks c3 and attacks e5. You can get out of both threats by taking on d4 here. And after bishop f5, you're down two pawns here if you're black, but black does have a lot of compensation. However, there's no clear win for black. There's a lot of game to come, and this seems like the most sensible route available at this point in the game to Bai Jin Shi. Instead, after pawn to e5, he played knight takes e5 instead of bishop takes e5. So this invites a queen sacrifice, and Ding Liren delivers. Pawn takes on c3 here, saying, I don't care about your pin on the d-file, come and take my queen. Bai Jin Shi does take the queen here, and you get c takes b2 check, not recapturing the rook right away, but using this discovery to uh, grab that pawn on b2 and create a very dangerous pawn on b2 that is one square away from promotion. Now, in this position, Bai Jin Shi makes the losing move. What he had to do was rook to d2. In fact, I think I've seen a lot of analysis that's criticized Bai Jin Shi in this position for not playing rook d2. It's so easy. Stockfish says rook d2 right away. How could a grandmaster not play rook d2 when you only have a two choices? You can go king e2 or you can go rook d2 and you pick the losing one. Grandmaster should never do that, right? Of course, it's more complicated than that. And after rook to d8, this seems really dangerous. There's a huge pin here on this d2 rook. It seems like it could go and there could just be a mating attack here for black. There's also a lot of lines to consider. Knight f3 is the strongest line here, but then bishop g4 comes, threatening to take this and take on d2. Now, 
the computer does reveal that you do have time here to take this pawn b2, which is what you really, really want to do. And white is actually doing okay here after trades and in this position White still got a good position. It's an interesting game. There's a lot that can happen here. Black does have some activity coming with rook d8 check, but this was the way to play. In the game, after c takes b2, king e2 was played. I suspect that part of the motivation for king e2, which is the losing move, is that now you're going to, after rook takes d8, immediately get that pawn back on b2. And also you didn't subject yourself to a pin. That seems like it might be a safer way to go. The problem now is that you have knight a4 from Ding Liren. The queen moves to c2. The knight hops into c3. Now, if you fall back to e1, there's a few ways to win. But the nicest way, I think, is knight to b5 check when the king can only go to e2 and then you can pick your knight doesn't matter which knight you can choose either one and you can drop into d4 with a beautiful royal fork here and you win material and the game so after knight c3 check the king steps up to f3 now this is a really interesting position of course you're never happy to have your king sitting on f3, but it's also not exactly clear how Ning Liren can checkmate this uh, king right here. And of course, if there could be some trades, you know, knight takes c6 and then bishop e5 or something, then maybe the pressure just goes away and white is doing fine. If you've not seen the game, this is a great point to pause your video and try to figure out how to continue black's attack. Well, Ding Liren found and played the amazing rook to d4, one of the best quiet attacking moves in chess history. The rook swings right into the square to create threats of g4 check, which are just checkmating threats. There's nowhere for the king to run here, and it seals off the king's access to the fourth rank. It's wonderful, and of course you can't capture the rook because knight takes d4 is a lovely royal fork here. There's quite a, a few lovely royal forks here coming from the knights. So after rook to d4 here, we get pawn to h3, trying to stop g4 check, of course, extremely sensible, and also creating an escape square for this bishop on g3, which is surprisingly important. Now h5 comes. I will mention that instead of rook to d4, Ding could have played pawn to h5 first. And again, the only really good move for white is pawn to h3 and then rook d4 could have come so you could have flipped the move order but you still have to have this rook d4 idea to really win the game um, in the most efficient fashion so after h5 here we get bishop h2 i did say that h3 was making an escape square for the bishop although the king is not happy to be running to g3 after g4 check <laughs> that bishop on h2 is just uh, sitting there staring at a king's butt, um, as many uh, peasants will do from time to time, but uh, it's certainly not doing anything productive here in this position. So after uh, king g3 here, again, you need an excellent move. And if you haven't seen the video, pause the video and try to figure out what black is going to play here. In my opinion, the most amazing thing about this position is that there's only one winning move, so Ding had to anticipate this when going for this line. It seems like many things could be winning here. Of course, the king's not happy here on g3, and I just mentioned how unhappy the bishop on h2 is. There's really a chain of unhappiness continuing to the rook on h1, but black has problems too. The rook is under attack here on d4, and there are ideas to exchange pieces and release the pressure. The winning move here is rook to d2 when suddenly everything makes sense in the black position. Again, we have another brilliant knight fork. If the uh, rook is captured, then the king and the queen are hit by knight to e4 check. So after rook d2, the queen is pushed to b3 when it's really out of the action here. And I'll mention that in many cases, being able to capture on f2 is an important part of the rook d2 idea. Now we get knight to e4 check. I mentioned the importance of being able to capture on f2. Here, if the king tries to run back towards the middle uh, with king f4, this would have worked if you had played knight e4 check instead of rook d2 on that critical move. 
Then here with king f4, you have rook takes on f2 check, and after king takes e4, you have bishop f5 check, really nice. The king keeps running, but then we have rook to d8 check. You get to block a couple of times the bishop gets free from h2, and rook takes d6, and a very, very nice checkmate here. So that's an important idea from this rook d2 move that access to f2 leads to a mating attack if the king runs to f4. So instead the king runs to h4, but now this king is dead in the water. So after king h4, we can continue the attack with bishop e7 check. There are many wins now, but Ding consistently finds the best move. King takes h5. Now king g7 is really, really nice. This bishop just needs to move so that the rook can come over to h8. That will generally lead to checkmate. And uh, it's better to move the king, I think, than to move the bishop and uh, allow b7 to be captured. So the move order is a nice move order. Now the bishop comes to f4 with an idea of going to h6. The bishop does get free from that h2 hole it was stuck in. Uh, bishop f5, bishop h6 check does happen. The king simply moves over to h7 here. The queen is able to capture on b7. And now, again, multiple moves will win. You do need to be precise with your calculation. Uh, Ding has fantastic calculation. That's one of his strong suits. He plays rook takes f2 here. Of course, it's not hard to believe that this king is out of luck. The way that the game continues is bishop to g5 here. All right, trying to stop knight to f6 um, in, uh, and knight to g3. Actually, knight g3 is the stronger threat. So now if knight g3, you're able to get back to h4 here. Rook to h8, nice quiet move, putting the rook behind the king, but threatening king to g7. Knight takes f7, attacking that rook here. And then the bishop falls back to g6. The knight was ready to capture. Um, if the bishop had gone to g6 in some earlier lines here, the king captures on g4, and it is checkmate in four. Ding does find checkmate, not postponing the game anymore. He plays knight to e5, and Bai Jinshi resigns. The reason that Bai resigns here is that if you do knight takes e5 here, then we now have access to uh, bishop f5 check here. And then when the king runs to h5, the longest you can resist, the king can move either to g7 or g8. Both are fine. You only have one block here. You're no longer supported by the knight that was on e7 earlier. And rook takes h6 and checkmate. What a game. It has inspired so many players in this last decade. So if you like the game, of course, check out the playlist that is on top of the board that is being updated with more incredible games from the last decade, my top 10 of the last decade. And as always, if you like the content, then you can like and subscribe, hit the bell to be notified of future videos.